Welcome to Comet with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV. Still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation. Sometimes it's the great debate, but it can only be either of those, of course, if you join in. That's why, above all, I need your telephone calls. 44208-601-4555. That's the number to call. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line. And remember, if you get on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be down at zero, or no one will understand either of us. You can SMS the show, and it comes up here on the comment wall. And the number for that is 447800008066. Or you can email me at comment at presstv.co.uk. That too, along with the Twitter, goes up on the comment wall. The Twitter address is comment underscore press TV. The subject we are discussing tonight may turn out to be extraordinarily prescient. Indeed, I dealt with it last week on the hashtag Ask Galloway that you may have seen after the comment show. I said then that the attack on Syria by the Israeli Air Force against a convoy of Hezbollah fighters, including a leader of Hezbollah and an Iranian general from the Revolutionary Guard Corps would certainly could be pregnant with the possibility of another 2006 style war between Israel and Lebanon. And we may be already in the early stages of that. Why did Israel launch this attack? Can anyone believe that they did not know or intend to kill the Iranian general? Can anyone believe that they did not know that the son of Imag Mugnia, uh, one of Hezbollah's big heroes, a great figure in that movement, uh, that his son was one of those that they were to kill? I certainly don't believe it, not for one moment. I'm certain that they consciously escalated their confrontation with Syria, with the Lebanese resistance, and with Iran, all in the one strike, on one single convoy. And I said on hashtag Ask Galloway last week that the resistance would answer. And indeed, yesterday they answered. They killed an Israeli captain and an Israeli sergeant. Uh, they destroyed nine vehicles. Seems a little odd that Israel only lost two soldiers and nine vehicles. Uh, maybe we'll find out more in the days to come. Uh, Israel responded with a ferocious bombardment, totally indiscriminate, so indiscriminate, it killed a Spanish soldier from Malaga who was there on patrol with the United Nations. Now, there's a very, very long history of Israeli murder of United Nations personnel. They murdered Count Bernadotte, the United Nations Special Envoy to Palestine uh, after the Second World War, before 1948. Count Bernadotte, uh, a member of the Swedish royal family, was shot in the face and killed by a man who went on to become the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Shamir. There have been innumerable attacks on United Nations personnel and property in uh, Palestine, the occupied territory of Gaza and of the West Bank. There was a massacre uh, by Israel of a United Nations compound in Lebanon. Uh, and so it didn't come as any surprise to me that the Israelis would indiscriminately bombard an area that was being held, patrolled by the United Nations. I'll go further. I'll say that they did it deliberately. When Lieberman called them, uh, the Spanish government, to offer his fake condolences, he said, and I'm quoting him, that Israel will respond in a disproportionate way. He's the foreign minister of the gangster state of Israel. A foreign minister who tells a foreign government whose soldier they've just killed with either reckless abandon or deliberately that they're going to respond disproportionately. You couldn't make it up. So why did Israel do it? And 
what's going to happen next? Who better to go to first? The sage of Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada, the redoubtable Gary. Gary, welcome to the show. Good evening, George. Good evening to you, sir. Go ahead. Well, this, uh, it's very interesting. We here were also uh, uh, predicting that there would have to be uh, retaliation, and uh, this came as no surprise. Um, the uh, presentation in the international media uh, that, is, that, that wants to suggest all kinds of things about Hezbollah's motives, Israel's motives, the interesting thing they're not mentioning, or they're saying almost nothing about, is there's a thing called an, called an election campaign going on in Israel at this moment. Yep. And this is, this is a tailor-made situation for the kind of adventurism that is typical of Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes, indeed. That's one of the reasons why I'm sure he launched the attack, Gary, uh, because he's under uh, pressure uh, from right and left in Israeli politics in this uh, general election, which comes up in March. Uh, but an ex-general, an ex-Israeli general, warned him today not to drag Israel into another catastrophic war uh, of unpredictable consequence uh, just for the sake of his own re-election. What are they saying in Canada about it all, Gary? Well, but you and I both know, George, that uh, the recklessness of the Zionists, once they're in full flow, knows no limits. Back in 2006, uh, they blamed the, the, the failure of Israel to, uh, to wipe out uh, Hezbollah. They blamed that on Dan Halutz, the head of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. They cashiered Dan Halutz. They didn't cashier him with an open discussion of the merits and demerits of his military role. First, they had a whole d ditzy little scandal that they published in the Israeli newspapers that Dan Halutz had illegally uh, stolen $30,000 in illicit earnings from the stock market. Then they, they embarrassed him, they humiliated him, so he had no choice but to leave. But did they have any investigation of what had actually happened to Israel at, 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 uh, at, uh, at Hezbollah's hands? No, they, whatever investigation they had, there was no public reporting afterwards. So well, this is going to be, they're going to deal with this latest thing the same way. They were not prepared for the, severe, the intensity of the uh, Hezbollah response. And that, I think, is very clear. All, everyone can see. Yeah, we, we have to be clear about this. Hezbollah opened fire on Israeli forces illegally occupying the Shaba Farms area of Lebanon. It is Lebanese territory, and they have every right to struggle militarily against the illegal occupier of a part of their territory. So that's the first point. The Israeli forces should not have been there. They should not have been in military vehicles in an illegally occupied piece of Lebanon. Secondly, Hezbollah have behaved entirely proportionately. The Israelis bombed one of their convoys and they have retaliated against one of Israel's uh, convoys. And the matter could have left there. But it's quite clear that Netanyahu, for a variety of reasons, wants to be, wants to be the air force for the Takfiri fanatics seeking and partially succeeding to tear Syria apart. No one can get out of this. This is an objective reality. They are attacking the regime forces of Syria when those regime forces are in total war with Al-Qaeda, with ISIS, and with a thousand other ragbag extremist organizations. Ipso facto, Israel is on the side in that conflict of the extremists that the Syrian regime are fighting. If you weaken the Syrian regime, you make stronger the Takfiri militants that are fighting the Syrian regime. If you attack those who are assisting Syria against Al-Qaeda and ISIS, it's really ISIS now, everyone has fallen in 
behind them, it's an existential struggle between ISIS and the regime in Damascus. There's only two sides. You have to choose which side you're on. I know which side I'm on. It's always the side that isn't ISIS. Where do you stand, Gary? Well, it's very clear that uh, where I stand and where those I work with politically stand is that Hezbollah is in the right and that uh, it's in the right from every direction. It's even in the right with regard to the Security Council resolution that's supposed to govern relations between Hezbollah and Israel in this period, uh, Resolution 1701. Uh, and it's very clear that uh, if, you, if you stand in defense of the territory of your own country, you can't, you can't be doing wrong. And that's, that's what the situation has exposed on that border at this time. Great call, Gary. Thanks for that. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, in North America, now we go to Malta, where Mario is on the line. Mario, welcome to the show. Yeah, good evening, George. Good evening, sir. Go ahead. Just say this man, Gary, is a really good... He's a very clever uh, man. man. He's yeah. a very, very clever I, man. I, I, I admire him. Mm. I admire him. Look, I'm going to say this. I think the president of Russia is much better man and even the Iranian president is much better man than, than Obama in the States. Because they've never gone to war and killing innocent people, you know. And this ISIS. How can they? How can they this ISIS? Some of them cover their faces, you know. They all look in European, so they cover their face. Or Americans. This is the whole thing. America won't stand. And, uh, well, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it wants it. It's certainly paying for it. And it couldn't be happening if America didn't pay for it. Even That's though, it. even though, Mario, yeah. Obama is being systematically humiliated by Netanyahu, who made yeah. a secret deal with John Bonar, the head of the U.S. Congress, that he would enter the United States and address both houses of the United States Congress. Bonar made this deal with Netanyahu behind the president's back, behind the back of the Democratic Party uh, in the U.S. Congress. It's a systematic, deliberate humiliation for President Obama. We know from the conversation between President Obama and the then President Sarkozy of France, what Obama really thinks of Netanyahu. But he continues to write Netanyahu any check that he's asked for, to deliver any military hardware that is asked for, to veto anything that Israel asks for, to strong arm Abbas and the Palestinian administration any time Netanyahu asks for it. So what can we say about a U.S. president? So weak, so supine, that even when the leader of a country of 7 million people is dancing all over his political grave, he continues to write the checks. Thanks, Mario. Let's go to Norway. Barry is on the line there. Barry, go ahead. Mr. Galloway, good evening, sir. Good evening to you, sir. You're welcome. We are behind you, we, and we are support. We are, how to call it? We are just on, on the same track with you. That we are Thank supporting. You. We are supporting those who are against the ISIL. Yes, those right. those war mongers. What they are doing, you know, the wall and the wall is tired and sick of what they are doing. Look, innocent people have been dying for years. America is not, in fact, encouraging human rights or democracy into all these countries, you know. What all they are doing is only they are fooling their, they, they are, uh, fooling their pockets, you know. That, that's the only thing. Look, Israel, the reason why Israel went on attacking, you know, how to call it, Hezbollah or killing these Hezbollah fighters, the, the only reason is they're trying to find a way to get into uh, Syria. That's the only reason. Look, enough is enough. Hezbollah, they are just, you know, doing the right thing to get rid of these terrorists. And who created these terrorists at the first place? Let's think of, you know, how to call it, Afghanistan. During the Soviet invasion there, who created, you know, how to, who, who, who created those, uh, how to call it, these Talibans? And then from there, Iraq. And it's not enough. Africa, Libya. And that's not all. They've been killing innocent people. And enough is enough. 
And now, if you look, if you keep on supporting Hezbollah or anyone who is against ISIL, they said, okay, you are the enemy of, you know how to call it, you are the enemy of America or the Amer uh, enemy of Israel. How comes? And believe me, they are even in the West here. We, these foreign backgrounds in the West here, when they hear our voice, you know what? The government goes after you. They keep on targeting you. Oh, you know, these are our enemies. And you know, George Galloway, they cannot hide. They cannot hide. Remember. Well, Barry, that's a very, very powerful call. Uh, I'm not going to try and better it. It was as powerful and passionate and cogent, eloquent uh, a contribution as we've uh, had on the show for a very long time. Barry, thanks for that uh, call. Let's go to Nigeria and talk to Ogashuwa in Nigeria. I hope we have a good line. Ogashuwa, welcome to the show. Good day. Good, good evening day, to you, sir. Go ahead. How are you? Yes, you're on the air. Good evening, sir. In fact, it is clear. Yes, it is clear that uh, the attack that has what has happened, it is true and justifiable because any attack that Israel is going to attack within the neighboring country or wherever he wants to attack, he must convert Americans. So, and they are saying that the interest of their alliance is more than any other interest. Likewise, the retaliation that is a uh, uh, did, it is on it is right track it is on right track because each and everyone we are supporting that one killing innocent people is abomination but what they have done they are supposed to protect their life self defense they reiterate and they, they reiterate through military not another civilian whatever that's what we want so it will serve as a dentra and the foolish muslim country that are supporting them supporting israel supporting america to to, 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 to cascade, massacre people day in, day out. The only solution, we are hailing Israel, and let the truth be justified. And the whole organization, I was listening to one of the, your programs, one of your guests was saying that a human right, whatever, there, there is that human right in the world whereby they are demolishing the, the Palestinian houses, killing innocent ones, sacking in Syria, uh, even down to Sudan, to, to, to Sudan about two years back. So what Hezbollah did, I am giving them kudos, and the whole world, the righteous picking human being, are giving them kudos for that. Well, uh, look, there is, no, <laughs> there is no doubt that Hezbollah acted lawfully by firing upon illegal occupiers of their country's territory. That is their legal, let alone their moral, right, indeed, duty. Israel illegally occupies the Sheba Farms district of Lebanon. And these Israeli soldiers were illegally present there. Secondly, the Hezbollah action was entirely proportionate for the reasons I mentioned earlier. But the bigger, more important question is this. The Syrian regime is in an existential fight to the death against ISIS. Anybody who enters the conflict against the Syrian regime is objectively, effectively, practically entering the war on the side of ISIS. Therefore, objectively, we have an Israel-ISIS alliance. That's why ISIS has never attacked Israel has no intention of attacking Israel, has never so much as thrown a stone at Israel, whilst cutting throats, eating hearts, lungs, amputations, crucifixions, mass murder in cold blood of every Muslim, of every Christian, of every Yazidi that they can get their hands on. Because ISIS objectively is in an alliance with Israel to try to break the resistance to ISIS in Syria. Which side are you on? I know which side I'm on. There's the comment wall. There's the telephone numbers, the uh, text and email uh, numbers and addresses. And of course, don't forget Twitter, comment underscore press TV. And the debate continues, of course, uh, on comment 
uh, after uh, the show has finished. Let me say a few things about Hezbollah, because you may recall quite a celebrated now encounter I had with Sky News during the war in 2006. When the presenter of Sky News described Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, and she said, most people in the world regard them as a terrorist organization. But as a matter of fact, most people in the world do not. But most people in the world do regard Israel as a terrorist state, as a dangerous state, a rogue state, an out of control rogue terrorist state with hundreds of nuclear weapons. Doesn't get much more dangerous than that. Hezbollah is the leading force in the Lebanese resistance. It has dozens of members of parliament, freely elected. It has members in the government, in the cabinet of the state of Lebanon. And in 2006, it gave the invading Israeli forces a bloody good hiding. And indeed, it had been doing so for quite some time. The otherwise, all of the south of Lebanon would still be under illegal Israeli military occupation. But like thieves in the night, they scuttled out of Lebanon in the year 2000. But they did not scuttle out of one remaining part of occupied Lebanese territory, the Sheba Farms area. And the military patrol of nine vehicles that was fired upon by Hezbollah is in the illegally occupied Sheba Farms area. Hope that's helpful. Anas is in Ghana. He's the last call in the first half. Go ahead, Anas. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Galloway. Good evening, sir. You're welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, I would like to first, first of all, thank you very much for your tremendous contribution to the development of world peace and justice. Thank you, brother. Yeah, first of all, I would like to make a comment, a brief comment on the Hezbollah-Israel scenario. You see, the world is replete with hypocrisy, double standard. Because if you look at, first of all, Hezbollah is an organization with a military wing that is aimed at resisting Israeli occupation. And at this crucial juncture, Hezbollah is fighting ISIS. Hezbollah itself has been a victim of terrorism on several occasions. Instead of the Israeli regime to attack ISIS, which is now posing a significant threat to the entire uh, region and beyond, you are rather attacking those who are fighting terrorism. So this was a clear hypocrisy against uh, the, uh, the war on terror. So it clearly stipulates or it clearly represents that Hezbollah is the financier, the supporter, the trainer of ISIS and then ISIL. So the Hezbollah attack against uh, Israel was a clear cut, uh, it was a right thing for Hezbollah to do. It was a right thing for Hezbollah to do in order to deter the Israeli regime from its aggressive uh, approach towards uh, Hezbollah. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallo. Well, no, thank you. Thank you, because that was an outstanding call, an outstanding analysis and summary of the situation we are in. Look. Israel illegally occupies, indeed has illegally annexed, recognized by nobody in the world, including the United States of America, illegally annexed a part of Syria known as the Golan Heights and declared that they will never, ever, in any negotiation, ever give it up. So a state of war exists between Israel and Syria. For the most part, that state of war has been an inactive one. It has been a peaceful frontier, notwithstanding that illegal occupation. By joining this war now, Israel has backed ISIS. That's what we're talking about. I'll be right back very shortly. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. We need your calls, we need your emails, we need your texts and your tweets. And the last three of those will come up here on the comment wall. Haven't had any up on the wall yet. I'm sure uh, we'll get to that. Indeed, we're ready for that now. Let's take some uh, Twitter comment that has come in. Uh, EBR recordings. Hezbollah is absolutely justified to carry out this act of resistance against the Zionist regime. And Israel is a rogue terrorist apartheid colony committing genocide on Arabs and Afghans. Well, I'm not sure that Israel is involved in Afghanistan, but uh, I take your point. And Nawab says, what justice? A Pakistani origin ISIS commander has admitted receiving U.S. dollars. ISIS is part of the USA-Saudi plan. Well, as I've explained before, I don't myself uh, believe that. Uh, but uh, objectively, there is no doubt at all that America is funding Israel and Israel is assisting ISIS in Syria if not also in Iraq. That doesn't mean that the ISIS people are conscious agents of Israel, still less that they are Israelis. The ISIS people are uh, uh, from those in the Muslim Ummah who are prey to the separatist, takfiri, fanatic ideology of bin Laden and those who have come after him. They are fueled by sectarian hatred, uh, and they hate the regimes that were largely imposed by foreigners upon the Arabs and indeed more widely upon much of the Muslim world. I'm not suggesting that every fighter or even any fighter in the ISIS forces is an Israeli agent. What I am saying is that Israel is acting on behalf of ISIS when it bombs the Syrian regime, when it bombs the Hezbollah allies of the Syrian regime, when it kills an Iranian general. That's just a matter of simple logic. Saudi Arabia did indeed support what has become ISIS. In fact, I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, genuinely, I'm sorry. The current present king of Saudi Arabia was the very man who did so. He was the very man who helped kickstart what has become ISIS. He was the point man for the Saudi regime with the very people who have become ISIS. Now, I have no doubt that their now fear of ISIS is genuine, as well it might be. But that doesn't invalidate the point that Saudi Arabia help to bring forth the serpents that are now described as ISIL. Uh, let's go to Afzal, who's in the UK. Why did Israel kill the Hezbollah fighters, Afzal? Oh, salam alaikum, George. How are you? Well, alaikum salam. By the grace of God, I'm good. Yes. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, George. I mean, as I said, you know, your guess is good as mine. Why did Israel attack this and attack that? Only God knows the real answer, but the only thing I can think of is Israel is running scared. Anything moves especially when Hezbollah and the other, especially the Iranian well, commander. They're definitely scared of Hezbollah, no doubt at all about that, as well they might be. You see the definitely, difference, definitely. The difference, Afzal, between uh, the leader of Hezbollah and many other Arab leaders is that when the leader of Hezbollah says something, he does it. He doesn't just talk, he acts. He said that there would be a response commensurate proportionate response to the attack in Conetra, there would be an answer from the resistance. And answer has there been. Afsa, go on. The answer was delivered anyway. You see, and, and the good thing about this is there's no civilian casualty there. They targeted the, uh, the army, and that was it. Uh, could you imagine if it was Hamas did that, retaliated, it would be full-blown war in Gaza. So at the end of the day, they're afraid of Hezbollah, like you said, they don't want to start a great war. And uh, as I said, you know, the Israelis is always running scared. The day will come when they have to disappear from the, uh, from the earth. Well, and I, I, I think the point is they no longer, and this was said actually by their own people after the war in 2006. In fact, if I'm not wrong, 
Shimon Peres himself said it, that for the first time, Israel had been defeated by an Arab oh. adversary. And this changed everything utterly. Israel oh. has been able to bully and browbeat and blackmail and occupy and subvert uh, all manner of political forces in the Arab world, but they cannot defeat Hezbollah. Hezbollah gave them a bloody good hiding in 2006, as their own people and their own inquiries made clear. They're a little bit afraid, more than a little bit, of the resistance in Gaza also, of course. Uh, every time they go in, they have to go out without achieving any of their stated objectives because the Palestinian resistance in Gaza is strong and absolutely dedicated to defending their little piece of the earth, which David Cameron himself described as just a very large prison camp. Afsa, thanks for that call, my friend. Let's go to Hen in Ethiopia. Very nice to talk to Ethiopia. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hi, George. How are you doing? Calling I'm doing well, the and uh, the better for talking to Ethiopia. A very long time since I've been there. Oh, you've been here before? I have, in, uh, in the 1980s, yes. Oh, okay, that's great to hear. Well, we're talking about uh, one country violating the territorial integrity of the other, yeah. and I just want to uh, bring up... Um, Ethiopia into this discussion, if you don't mind, George, because uh, your discussion forum is very open for a variety of opinions, I think. I, I, have, no, and, I um, have no objection, as you're on the line. Say whatever you like. Well, it's just that uh, I believe you are aware of the current uh, issue between Ethiopia and Egypt concerning, uh, concerning the Nile. And you're one of uh, the most critical uh, pro-poor people, uh, an advocate of the poor, that I know of in this uh, current uh, day and age. Okay. And uh, I just want to know uh, your opinion about uh, the current situation and sort of a um, uh, de facto confrontation between Ethiopia and Egypt concerning the Nile. And also, um, if your attitude about Ethiopia has changed over time, uh, I used to hear you saying uh, a number of, um, let's say, uh, politically incorrect statements about Ethiopia. Oh, please, uh, en enlighten me, enlighten me, please. Enlighten me. Pardon? Enlighten like, me. Like, like, the country, like the country is an agent of the United States, you know, things like that, uh, which, uh, which I don't think uh, are, are uh, you know, based on strong foundations. So, uh, really? well, we can set that aside, and I just want to hear your input about mm -hmm. Ethiopia and Egypt, if you okay. don't mind. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I'm an opponent of both regimes involved in this argument. I'm an opponent of the Ethiopian regime, which I knew when they were pro-Albanian Maoists. Uh, and I'm certainly uh, not uh, any better inclined towards them now than I was then. There is absolutely no question at all that Ethiopia has regularly, in relation to its neighbors, played the role of United States agent. On the other hand, I am one of the leading opponents, I think, of the military junta, which has drowned democracy in a sea of blood in Cairo, in Alexandria, and indeed throughout Egypt. So when it comes to these two regimes, I have no dog in the fight, but I do care what happens to the poor masses in both Ethiopia and Egypt. And that's why I say that this question of the course of the Nile and the share of the waters has to be negotiated, has to be negotiated in the context of the uh, OAU, of the African Union as it's now known, the AU, uh, and it has to be fair to the people of both countries. As for the regimes, I'm very happy to see the back of both of them. But thank you for uh, remembering me. Neil is in Kent. Let's hear from him. Neil, go ahead, sir. Hello, George. How's things? Yes, I'm great, thanks. Go ahead. 
Great. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying I have a huge amount of respect for you and what you say and what you do. You're about the only politician in the UK at the moment that's actually got the guts to stand up and, and say what everybody is actually thinking. Thanks, Neil. First off, uh, this business with Israel and ISIS. Um, uh, I have problems with the fact that you don't believe that the US are actually funding ISIS. Mm. Um, the picture that was taken with John McCain with ISIS fighters mm. in the background, mm. well, the fact that, that this fighter has just mm. come forward and said, you know, we have received money from the US, um, it, it all points to the fact that this was a problem that was generated to start with to destabilize the Middle East and create a greater Israel. This well, is what uh, all uh, the fighting is about. No, uh, it's not. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you're partly right, but let me deal with the part in which you're wholly wrong. The idea that there's any plan outside of the heads of the most deranged to have a greater Israel that reaches Iraq is simply nonsensical. Israel cannot handle the territory it has already occupied. The idea that in any conceivable future that Israel could rule from the Nile to the Euphrates, which was, I'll grant you, the original Zionist dream, is completely nonsensical. So the fighting uh, of ISIS uh, with the regime in Baghdad and with the regime in Damascus is not about creating a greater Israel. These people who are doing that fighting are fanatic extremist Muslims of the very narrowest kind, the very most backward kind. And they're not doing it, I assure you, to make a greater Israel. Now, of course, John McCain is deep up to his neck in any trouble anywhere in the world. Similar pictures uh, could be adduced about his role, for example, in the Ukraine. Uh, he is up to making as much trouble for those he perceives to be the enemy of his worldview as he possibly can. And there are pictures in which he is meeting ISIS fighters. Although it's a bit of a kaleidoscope, Neil, because today's FSA is tomorrow's ISIS. Yesterday's Al-Qaeda is today's ISIS. ISIS is steadily consolidating almost all of the military and political elements present in Syria behind its banner. So anybody who has given any support to the so-called Syrian revolutionaries is, you're right, partly responsible for the phenomenon which we now know as ISIS. As far as that goes, I'm absolutely with you. But the United States is now bombing and killing ISIS. It's bombing and killing them in both Iraq and in Syria. It has successfully installed in Baghdad a prime minister of its choosing. And it has given him his marching orders. And they are this, to try and make a coalition government in Iraq stable enough to rally a national army and a national effort to recover, recapture the one third of the country which has fallen to this ISIS. Now, if you are saying to me that they're killing ISIS and paying ISIS both at the same time, it's my view that even by the standards of the United States, that's very unlikely to be true. It's undoubtedly true that America's two key allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, are both involved in the ISIS story. Israel, for the reasons I've been talking about throughout this show, is actively, militarily engaged in support of ISIS. Saudi Arabia was previously flooding people who became ISIS with money and weapons, and indeed opening their jails to convicted uh, life uh, and, uh, and death row prisoners, life sentence prisoners and death row prisoners, uh, and saying you can leave the prison, but you have to go and fight with ISIS. Now that too has begun to change, because Saudi Arabia is now mortally threatened 
by the very Frankenstein monster that they produced. Now, thanks for the call and thanks for the kind words. Mehdi is in California, USA. Go ahead, Mehdi. Uh, hello, George. Uh, glad talking to you. And I'm glad I'm calling from country. At least we have uh, freedom of uh, speech. In another world, Do you? we don't go to jail for what we say. Do you? In do you really? Do you really have freedom yes. of speech in the United yes, States? Yes, I do. Yes, really? I do. Actually, anytime I want, I go to sidewalks, they call it public land, and I talk about anything I want, whether it's about Obama or George Bush. Yeah, as long as nobody's CIA, listening to you. As, lo as, long as, nobody's, as long as nobody's listening to you. Pardon me? Have you been on Fox News lately, Mehdi? Yes, I know. But let me, the, the beginning my my talking about freedom of language is, you know, what happened about what acting Israel did last two, three weeks. If, if we are honest to ourselves, I'm not defending Israel at all, at all. But I'm questioning you as a Muslim that are you believe Saudi Arabia are Muslim country or not? And then I co continue my comment to you. If, if, if the answer is yes. It is. Why they cooperate with it is. Israel it, it is, the way uh, all the Muslim people All right, all right. Israel. Keep quiet for just a minute, and I'll answer your first question. The 99% of the citizens of Saudi Arabia are God-fearing, uh, devout Muslims. They are ruled by a, a, a family of hypocrites, kleptocrats, who deliberately foster sectarian hatred in order to protect their own position in the gilded palaces of Arabia. Now, go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay, as I grew up in Iran as a, in a Muslim family. I, I learned something. The Jewish people in general, with all respect to all of them, as a, as a preacher of God, they are a scary people. They are scared. They are not like us. If you tell them I'm coming to kill you tonight, they really believe it. So we should not mess around with them like that because they, they show reaction right away. I'm, I'm really not following the logic of that. First of all, no, because for, 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 first of all, Jews are followers of a particular religion. They have no collective psychosis or psychology. They, there are extremely brave Jews and there are extremely scared Jews, or scary, as you put it. Uh, they have, in some cases, every reason to be scared. After all, millions of them uh, were annihilated in Europe in the lifetime of some of the people watching this television program tonight. But if you're saying, as I think you really are, that Hezbollah should not resist the Israeli military occupation of their country, well, frankly, they're not waiting for your permission, uh, nor for my approbation. They're already doing it. I think we've heard enough from you, Mehdi, in the land of the free speech in California. Eh? Let's hear from Mohammed in the UK. Go ahead, Mohammed. Hello, salam alaikum, George Galloway. Wa alaikum salam, go ahead. Thank you um, very, very much to all of you, Press TV, and you for giving me the chance um, to have my comment and uh, opinion on Welcome. this matter. Um, I'm not too familiar with the question, but um, I have a view and a, and a point. I hope that you can hear it and everyone yes. else. These, um, these people are extremely confused in, in what they have to do and what measures they have to take. Now, if... Now, if, if Hezbollah, what I don't understand is, if Hezbollah really wanted to intervene in Israel and Palestine and the, and the killings of, of the innocent people there, then why haven't they done it? That's the first thing I have to say. The second thing Did is you, that... Were you, were you on the moon were, in 2006? Sorry? Were you on the moon in 2006? Did you miss the war? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You do, know, you do know that it's the only, exactly. you do know that Hezbollah is the only Arab army that has ever inflicted a military defeat on the Zionist state, don't you? No, I, I, no, I didn't know that, no. 
Really? I didn't know that. You didn't know so that had Israel had defeated the Egyptian army, the Syrian army, the Jordanian army, the Iraqi army? You didn't know that? Yeah, I well, knew that, yeah. Well, let me tell you this. This was back when there was no flags, right? This is back. This let me, like let, back let, let me tell no you this. Let, let me tell you this. Israel, for most of my life, has been occupying Lebanon. They've occupied them in 1974, in 1982, and that occupation in 1982 lasted until 2000, 18 years. And they left like thieves in the night, overnight, because they could not withstand the attrition of the resistance that Hezbollah was dealing them. And then in 2006, when they came back, Hezbollah gave them that bloody good hiding. Now go on. Okay. Yeah, so if ISIS were the right, if they were the right group to bring back any type of Islamic government, then they would have done the job ages ago instead of, instead of fighting innocent people and fighting a, a, a government that may or may not be corrupt. They would have went straight to Israel, right? Well, they have. They're the only people whoever have, they land rockets wherever they please in Israel in retaliation to Israel's rockets against them. Said Hassan Nasrallah asked everybody in Lebanon to look out their windows and look at the sea and told them there's an Israeli warship there. We're about to set it on fire. And by the time the people got to their windows, the warship was on fire. Hezbollah are resisting Israel. Now I know where you're coming from because I've been here a long time and I know from your voice and what you're saying what you're getting at. Look, Hamas, the entirely Sunni, part of the Muslim Brotherhood, Palestinian resistance in Gaza has today congratulated Hezbollah on their military action yesterday. Why can't you do so? Why can't I do so? Yeah. Because I'm in London, and if I take a flight to any Muslim country, I probably wouldn't come back, bro. <laughs> no, you don't want to, because my inference is that you're blinded by sectarianism. That's the only possible reason why somebody called Muhammad would come today on national, international television to attack not ISIS, not Israel, but Hezbollah, the only successful uh, Arab power that has ever defeated Israel on the battlefield. The, the discussion continues on Twitter. Comment underscore Press TV. Hello, just comment. Name and a picture. Number. Just make sure it's like your telephone number. Zero zero. Are you spelling your name for me? Yeah, I know. I know. You need to register for this. You need a phone number. Can I have your telephone number? Okay. So I'll send you a call.